Well, to begin with, this is a Tennessee car, so you can see it's clean. It's not rotting away, so you don't have to worry about rust on the frame or anything. You got a four liter single overhead cam V6 engine. It's actually a very reliable engine. This one's got 160,000 miles, doesn't burn any oil. These are great engines because there's no turbos on them. They're normally fuel injected, so they don't have problems with any carbon buildup. And it's pretty well set up when they do break for replacing parts. The problem with these Fords, of course, is that this isn't a plain old rear wheel drive one, which is simpler. This, you can see, you can have auto, 4x4 high, 4x4 low. The weakest thing is the four wheel drive system. It costs more, it weighs more, and of course it makes these things gas hogs. He says he probably averages about 16 in this thing. If you don't need a four wheel drive, all wheel drive vehicle, my advice is don't buy it, especially if you're buying an older one. Now he's put 80,000 miles on it. He's got his 10 grand worth out of it, but let's say you are gonna buy this vehicle today, I would try to talk you out of it. It's gonna be super expensive, when it finally goes out, it's probably going out a little now. We're going to check it with a scan tool. Now, on the other hand, if you're a mechanic like me, you can find a lot of good looking ones like these in the South that don't move under their own power and you can pick them up for four or five hundred bucks. Then you can put the transmission transfer case in yourself. If you're a riverboat gambler, you like rolling a dice, try one in a junkyard. But really, the age of this, they're pretty worn too. You're better off getting remanufactured units. If you're willing to spend that kind of money, go right ahead. Consider what a new 4x4 costs. Hey, you got to put four or five grand in one that you picked up for 500 bucks. That's not a bad deal. But if you're the type of person that's looking for something you're going to buy used and you want to drive the family around in, I'd stay away from one of these 4x4s with 160,000 miles on it. Now let's start it up. Start right up. And as you can hear and see, the engine's running smooth, doesn't make too much noise. These are excellent engines. It's the transmissions on these all-wheel drive ones that have the problems. Now, he's already replaced the hub on this side. I'm assuming this one's probably going to need replacing. Probably had some slippage, but for computer and look at the data first. And while it's looking up stuff, you can see this is a work truck. He's got all the stuff in here. AC gauges, you name it. You can use these for a work truck. Now he actually does use the four wheel drive in his business and stuff. When it snows, doesn't sell you much around here, but it does once in a while, but mainly for mud and goop and rain and all that stuff. It does work well. Just realize with the Fords, it has a limited lifespan. It's looked up, you just got everything explored, a 2V 4 liter automatic. So up it comes, diagnosis. And here we go with an auto scan. And we're scanning around, you see he's not lying. It just turned 160,000 miles on it. And really, it doesn't look that bad. Of course, it's a Ford, so the radio's broken. But on the plus side, the air conditioner still works. And yes, it does have a sunroof. And now uh, you can see there's a few faults here. So we're going to go through them all. This is low, we don't care about. Occupant classification system, we don't care about that either. So we'll turn it off, we'll turn it back on, and... We'll erase that stupid code. Now it's got a gem module, general electrical module. There's some codes there. They might lead to something. There's four of them. Double with a fourth. They'll get wacko electronics up. You can see there's a whole bunch of them. But we really don't care. Lamp, headlamp, input circuit, short to ground. Okay, so what he's done is he's replaced the headlamps with the LEDs. And that's why he has all these headlamp codes because it confuses the system. Now they work. The warning light comes up on the dash, but uh, it's Tennessee. Nobody does any kind of inspections. We don't care. The headlights work. But for those of you who live in some place where they check all that crap, realize you can't just replace stuff with LEDs. You got to make sure you have the right bells, resistors, all kinds of other crap. So, you know, if your headlights work okay, my advice in that case is leave them alone. If you got a Ford, not a Toyota, they don't care. You just put the LEDs with bells, resistors, away they go. These are a little more particular. So, and the last one is satellite audio digital receiver system. Considering that the radio doesn't doesn't even work, you know? I don't think you're gonna care much about that. But we'll see what it says just for kicks. ECU electronic control unit internal fault and electronic control unit internal fault. Okay, well, really? Sensors for the radio system, we really don't care. What he's curious about is what kind of shape the powertrain's in. So we want to look at the live data. There's all the live data. We'll start looking at it. So far, everything's looking pretty good. We can see the output shaft data. We'll put it in gear. Now you can see it's zero because we're in gear and it's not spinning anymore. We put it in park 
it'll start spinning again. So we just we know that data is being applied and it, it's real data. You see there's no misfires. The fuel right pressure, 370, 364, 368.45. So it's real close what it's commanding and what it's getting. So even the fuel pump's in excellent shape. Here's the fuel pump percentage. Okay, it's running at 24% now. If we rub it up, of course, it'll go higher. These injectors are fine. They got no faults. It's a four liter engine and the mass airflow sensor is 3.95, line two, that's right spot on. That's working fine. The, the module's fine, 14.21. And you can see in the transmission, the output shaft speed failure mode. That has no faults. Pressure control modules on the transmission, no fault. Gives you their pressure. Shift solenoids on, it shows there's no faults with the shift solenoids either and the torque converter unlocking due to slipping there's no faults in that so if it is slipping it's not slipping bad but what we're going to do here is we're going to put down torque converter data and we're going to record it and here we go still handles decently but he's worried about his transmission so the lift gate jar is open because he got something out of the trunk and didn't close it so you can't blame the truck on that right that's way too hot in here the heat works We'll turn that off. Now I can feel a slight slippage taking off there, but we'll go to our little drag strip. And here we go. Still got plenty of pulling power. The engine's working fine. The tranny isn't horrible. I can feel a little slippage, but let's see what it does when it's under a full load. There's nobody behind us, so here we go. Hey, it still takes off pretty good. Full load, decent shift. Another decent shift, we'll let go. Downshift's very smoothly, no jerking yet. Now we'll see what passing gear goes like. We'll floor it. Smooth, still working pretty good. All in all, I meant to floor things rattle as they age, but hey, it's still running pretty good. Oh, Bonnie and Clyde, they used to steal Fords all the time because they said they were nice, fast getaway cars. And hey, this thing, it's still got get up and go with 160,000 miles. Now I notice when I turn it hard here, I can feel a little slippage in the right front. Now he's changed the hub on the left front, so he should change the hub on the right front. But when you're going straight, you don't feel any then. Now as I said earlier, if this had been a conventional two-wheel drive Explorer with just rear-wheel drive, and not the all-wheel drive system, I would tell somebody if they're gonna buy this vehicle, go ahead and buy it, because there's no coach in the transmission, and no problems, but with that transfer case, I'd be real leery about buying one of these things used in an all-wheel drive version. So we'll go back in time here. We'll start looking at the information as it plays back. And all of that is black, it's all normal. It didn't slip much at all. 160,000 miles now, he's put 80 of them on getting his money's worth he did have to change that hub and eventually have to change the one on the other side transmission isn't slipping too much you saw in the road test upshift downshift the engine runs like a top now if i had a customer looking to buy this thing i would try to talk him away find one with the four wheel all wheel drive system on it because that will eventually break and cost a fortune to fix if this had been just the rear wheel drive one i would have put hands down buy it at a good price because it's in excellent shape yeah the radio doesn't work who cares you can put another radio in it got stupid communication codes we don't care about that either with the four wheel drive system i would be exceptionally leery if i were you buying one with 160,000 miles unless they had information that the transfer case has been replaced to rebuild, front assemblies have been replaced left and right. It's not gonna go three, 400,000 trouble free miles. Now you gotta take in consideration that it's a normally aspirated V6 engine, doesn't have turbochargers, doesn't have gasoline direct injection. So an old thing like this, hey, the shame it isn't just rear wheel drive because then it wouldn't need anything done. It might last them quite some time, but eventually that four wheel drive system is going to go out. With a Ford, unlike Subarus, the all wheel drive systems have a limited lifespan on them. Don't run it good enough. Now, yeah, the front wheel, like I said, it's slipping a little because he didn't change the right side, but eventually that transfer system is going to go out and then it's going to cost a fortune to fix where if it was rear wheel drive, you just keep cruising down and you got so much less to fix too. If the transmission brakes on just the rear wheel drive, that's it. So it's a lot simpler and it's going to last a lot longer. BMW X5 here. People say horrible things about them. People say great things about them. 
Here's a real one that a guy bought used. Okay, the original MSRP was $78,000. He paid 28 grand with 40 something thousand miles on it. Now, this guy had worked on the assembly line at BMW, and now he does stuff like testing them out. He could take these things apart and put them back together again. That's one of the reasons he bought the car, and the other reason was he lives in South Carolina, where strangely enough, he found a British mechanic who works on these things, who's honest. Now, this may be the only BMW mechanic in the world who's honest, as far as I'm concerned. Now, you can see why people buy them, because they're beautiful SUVs, they're luxurious inside. <laughs> we'll go on the other side while we're walking around. The leather interior's immaculate, it's got the dual sunroof, lots of room in the back. As a warning, if you don't know any BMW mechanics, and you buy one of these, you better have a big piggy bank for repairs. In the case of this one, he has had to replace the air conditioning compressor between 40 and 80,000 miles. It was $3,100. He had to replace the compressor, the condenser. The compressor just flat blew a hole in itself. Even at that price, if he'd taken it to the dealer, it would have been even more. <laughs> so, you realize they're not cheap to fix. But, as you can see, here's the injection system. It is solidly built, an inline six. He took the plastic crap engine cover off and threw it away, because he knows about machines, it doesn't serve any purpose. And truthfully, hey, he lives in South Carolina. You do not want heat to build up on your engine. You want it to dissipate. Now, if you live in Alaska, I can understand it. It's freezing cold, you want the heat to stay under there, but where it's hot, a beauty cover actually serves negative benefits. It's hurting the vehicle by holding the heat in. I mean, look, all this stuff's plastic. This little plastic line broke, and this little plastic hose here was 75 bucks. Let me tell you, <laughs> that's the tip of the iceberg on one of these. As you can see here, this is the charge hose, right? And this charge hose, he tried an aftermarket one, but it blew off. So he had to go back to OEM, and this hose was a $410 part. Like I say, tip of the iceberg on these things, the parts cost a small fortune. That's one of the reasons that he could get a $78,000 car for $20,000. I don't care what kind of nonsense they give you about, oh, high resale values. I remember way back decades ago, BMW touted that they had the highest resale value in the world. They claimed that their 528 version had the highest resale. They found some item that they barely sold many of and then the next year the prices went up so the resale value of the other ones they claim was high this is more reality bmw 70 something grand for a new one 40 000 goes for 20 something grand that is the reality of things because most people understand that BMW stands for bring my wallet when it comes time to maintain and fix the car. And check out the tires. He's got nice tires. You know why he's got nice tires? Because this baby come with those stupid run flat tires and he said it rode like crap. Why would I want a car like this that rides like crap? That's the big reason you really don't see too many cars anymore using run flat tires. Yeah, I mean, if you're worried that, you know, bad people are coming after you with guns. <laughs> You want to have bulletproof tires that run flat? Yeah, but if you want a nice car that rides nice, run flat tires stink. So, he went to normal good tires. You can see these aren't crazy low profile. They're normal tires, normal rims. They're not that crazy going to go flat every time you hit a curb or hit a pothole and blow out. They're much better with these tires on them. Now, this car has about every option there is but he went with the base wheels. He didn't want to pop his tires on the potholes and deal with that crap, but everybody wants these big wheels with low profile because the way they look. This guy's smart. He got this for the way that it drives. The original idea of BMW was the ultimate driving machine. And way back in the 60s, hey, they were driving circles around American cars, and they kept their driving up. It's just that they started going too much into stylistic crap that doesn't serve a purpose. We'll take a look inside. Start her up. Whoa, look at that BMW, boy. That's a really cool little Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Now you can hear, this is one strong running engine. I'm gonna put my scan tool on it, but BMW and these six cylinder engines, they can run forever. Smooth power delivery, nice smooth idle, 
A lot of companies have gone away from straight sixes, not BMW. These things are solid built. And this one has an excellent transmission. He says it shifts even better now than it did when he bought it years ago. They're solid built cars. It's the plastic and electronic stuff that'll drive you nuts. And as he just told me, you gotta maintain them. A lot of people don't maintain anything, okay? Let's say you're gonna buy a Toyota, right? Buy a Toyota, change the oil every five, 10,000 miles. That's about it. First 100,000 miles, 10 years, that's probably all you're gonna have to do. These you have to maintain. If you don't maintain your car, don't buy a BMW. Oh, so we turn the old scanner on. Diagnosis, X5, US. Diagnosis and an auto scan. Here we go. So here we go. Now we always expect a few codes. We'll start out with the integrated chassis management. It has one fault. And the code is signal invalid from a transmitter. <laughs> from the electric power steering. As the owner just said, if you heard him, stupid German stuff. Yes, the Germans get carried away with just about everything. We really don't care about that. There's also an electronic power steering code. Let's look at that. I bet it's the same code too, watch. Electronic power steering torque sensor steering angle index faulty intermittent. So we'll erase that too. The headlight high system is <laughs> two codes let's see what those codes are it's actually getting to be comical now okay intermittent connection headlight to cid no communication cid image data invalid or faulty <laughs> so we'll erase those two so according to this the adaptive headlights aren't adapting quite correctly but <laughs> he has no problem seeing when he's driving nobody's flashing their brights at him so we'll see what else is on the computer we have the integrated automatic heating and ac okay that's got a fault too let's see what that fault is all right people you're not gonna believe this but this one is stratification flap motor, front right, locking has been detected. You're gonna find this on any BMW as it ages. You're gonna get wacky codes up the wazoo because of all the technology. You wouldn't believe how many separate modules are on this thing. And all it takes is one little glitch. Realize all these computer modules work on five volt reference signals not much power and usually the amperage that goes through them is milliamps thousands of an amp hardly any little glitch and it'll do squirrely stuff like this so we'll go back we'll erase that too now all the codes are gone except for this first one the integrated chassis management it erases but it immediately comes back on It'll be the same code for sure. Signal EPS is invalid, the transmitter for the electronic power steering. So according to this, it's not getting the actual position of the power steering. There's something wrong either in the wiring or the sensor itself. But like I say, he hasn't had any problem driving it around. So let's look at live data. Two live data, battery voltage is fine. Remember, these are color coded. If anything's weird, it's gonna be color coded and be off. But look at all this stuff, ambient pressure, ambient temperature, throttle valve opening position, charging pressure. Oh, look at the German plus here. The data's here on this machine. Do I have to get a pressure gauge and hook it up? Fuel, maybe it'll leak, start a fire. Then you gotta buy new gaskets. This, at least you get a good machine like this, you can actually read it to see if it's working right or not. I'll give them an A plus for that one. <laughs> And check this out. Variable camshaft timing exhaust position with engine running. It's running. It is 4.06 per 0.22. It moves around a little. Kerbal winkles means crank angle. The angle of the crank. Yes, they have to have everything in strange languages, even on the machines that we Americans use. So here we go with more of the pressure. I mean, look at this. Running rough value. Pretty close to zero, I mean. Look, we're talking about you're off of 23 one hundredths of a percent, it's practically nothing. Of course, there's no misfires, they're all zero. But the Germans go further than misfires, they go to rough running values. Now that one was perfect for a second, it was point zero zero zero. Oh, now it's point zero four nine point zero six zero point zero zero again. That's the Germans for you. In their search for perfection, they find out well, we can get close, but we can't get the whole way. Good, but you can see, look at the amount of data. This thing has so many modules on it, it will make your head spin. Alternator temperature, alternator excitation current. You can really analyze these things if you want to go that far. It shows you the whole sensor, one accelerator pedal voltage, sensor two pedal voltage. They really make it so you can analyze the stuff. There's no arguing that. And ignition timing on a running engine, it's running. It is three degrees 
Kerbal Winkle, 3.75, 4.5. We'll rev it up, of course. It'll go up then because it's got advanced timing. Well, it's actually in excellent shape. Kerbal Winkles are not, so let's take it for a spin. And of course, it's got a killer stereo. We got all kinds of look wide angle, side angle, regular angle. Look, we can see Stop everything. You. Look. Here we go, we're moving, it can see we're moving. I love these cameras. Now this baby even has night vision on the front. Let's hope it doesn't have an MG42 under the hood too. <laughs> and of course, as you can see here, it's got a nice heads up display. Shows you how fast you're going and the speed limit where you are, it's 25 miles an hour here. Comes in real handy. And this is broad daylight. We're looking at this thing driving into the sun. This really works well. And now you can really see why people buy these things because they're fun to drive. They're very smooth. It's kind of like riding on a magic carpet ride, but hey, they handle like a dream. It's just the repairs that are nightmares. <laughs> so here we go to our little drag strip. Nobody's coming, so well, somebody's coming there. You take these things out in the country, out in the highway, that's what they're made for. And here we come to our little drag strip. Now realize, this is just a six cylinder inline engine, but the Germans know how to make them. We'll check the shifting and we'll check the engine. Ready, set, go. Smooth power delivery. Those shifts, you can barely feel it shifting. That's how they sell them. You get in one of these and drive it, you're gonna think, oh man, I'm in love with the BMW. <laughs> but it may be one of those love affairs that doesn't last over time. And after you divorce your fifth wife, you might wonder, gee, maybe I should stay away from those things. This has got 81,000 miles on it now, but hey, it really doesn't have anything wrong with it at all other than all that crazy German nonsense angle, this, that, and everything else. It steers fine. It drives fine. Look at that passing gear. You can pass people in this, and the engine just keeps ticking. They're pretty quiet inside. We'll come to a stop. The other thing I hear is the fan. It's on low. That's all I can hear is the fan on low. Smooth as can be. These six cylinder engines, that's what they're made for. Smooth power. Now, gas mileage, not so much. He gets around 20 miles a gallon, but this is an all wheel drive vehicle, too. It's heavy and it's fast. So, you know, you can't whine about 20 miles a gallon if you're going to drive something like this and have some fun in it. It's not made for gas mileage. That's one of the reasons that straight six engines really aren't that much around because they do use a bit more fuel than a V6 configuration will. And one of the reasons he went for the six cylinder was because he didn't want the V8 because he knows about BMWs. He works for him. <laughs> and he knows the valve stems on the V8s go bad. You got to pull the engines. It costs a lot of money. My grandson's got a V8, BMW, and yes, the valve seals are gone and it burns oil. They all do that. It's a known flaw. On these six cylinder engines, no, they're strong engines. And listen to that sound. Yeah. It's a six cylinder engine, but boy, it's got a nice hum to it. BMW X5. Known as one of the most expensive vehicles in the world to take care of and maintain, but this guy maintains it. And he has a English mechanic who knows how to work on them. You can see the technology from my fancy computer that's in these things. It's absolutely insane, but they are fun to drive. The engines are solid. The transmissions are solid. Just realize you got to maintain them and you're going to have to find yourself a mechanic like he did. The English guy who understands, guy like me with equipment that can actually see what's going on, understand how to fix these things because they are so complex. Ford's 10 speed automatic transmission. This is a 2018 Mustang. It's had problems, he had a lot of work done on it. So we're gonna show you what's happened to this. Give an overall view of the Mustang too, but mainly we're gonna talk about the transmission. It's a 10 speed automatic transmission that Ford and GM worked on together. Then it was like cats and dogs. They went their separate ways soon after, but got 10 speeds and three of them are overdrives for better gas mileage. Those three overdrives, you can get good gas mileage if you drive conservatively. The best he can get in this is 27 on a highway. Okay, when I drive these things, I get like four miles a gallon because I drive them like a maniac. But for the overall car itself, he really has no complaints. He hasn't had any problems with it. It's got 57,000 miles on it other than he didn't like the chrome, so he plastic dipped it. He's got to do that over. Plastic dip doesn't always last that long. But he's real happy with the car, except for the transmission. When he first got it, it was acted up, he took it in. They reflashed the ECM. They ended up changing the valve body. At 14,000 miles, they changed the torque converter. 
And then recently, they did some more work. So he's had the torque converter change, the valve body. He's had it reflashed a bunch of times. He's gonna have me check it out with my machine. We're gonna take it for a good road test. But the problem is this was one of their earlier versions of the 10 speed. I do have to say, I did one a few weeks ago on a year old 10 speed automatic and it didn't really have any problems. The only problems that you have to understand with that transmission is it is set up for gas mileage. You're not gonna find too many fast Mustangs that get 27 miles a gallon, right? You gotta drive them slow, but it can do that. The ones I drive never do, and the normal ones I used to drive, I'd be lucky if I got 14 on the highway driving conservatively. So you can get good gas mods this way. So on the new ones, the one that I did a few weeks ago, they're better than these by far, but still, if you are in an economy mode, when you're taking off from slow, especially if you're at a stop sign, maybe you're turning right, going up a hill, sometimes they hunt for gears. If you have them in economy mode, if you switch over to sports mode, generally, they work really well, especially the new ones. They've got that set up better. So if you really want to zoom around, put it in sports mode, and they go back to economy mode whenever you want an economy. That's why there's the different modes. It's for different driving styles. And if you don't understand what it's for, Lauren, in this case, it was the guy's wife. <laughs> she didn't even know there were different modes. And I explained, hey, look, put it in sports mode. They put in sports mode, and then she didn't complain about lack of acceleration. You can bypass some of the problems by going into sports mode. Now, like I said, he's real happy with the rest of the car. The five liter engine's got plenty of pulling power, doesn't burn any oil. And like I say, if you drive it conservatively with the three overdrives, he can get as much as 27 miles a gallon, which is a miracle for a Mustang. So we're gonna look at the data and we're gonna take it for a spin. Got a lot of nice controls on your steering wheel. Nice little small steering wheel, black and chrome. Seats are nice and comfy, hold you in. It's a typical Mustang. There's some room in the back seat, not outrageous for long leg people, but they're comfortable enough if you're shorter. Killer sound system, speakers all over the place. In case you're interested in the transmission. So, first gonna do a big scan, and so we shall analyze it, and then we're gonna look at all the transmission data. As I said, okay, this thing got 57,838 miles on it, and we'll do a diagnosis. It's got a decent touch screen, works relatively fast. You just set your temperature, you turn traction control off if you want. And you get to play with the modes too. As you can see, there's various modes. We'll start out with normal mode, sport plus, track only, drag strip, and snow or wet. And these aren't just buttons that are there to look cute, you know, with little icons. They actually do things. You're not supposed to use a drag strip in regular driving. The snow or wet one is going to put it in different gears so the wheels don't slip. It's a pretty sophisticated system. Oh, there's a few little faults here. We'll start with the anti-lock brake system. Tire diameter is confused. No one reset it right, so we don't care about that. We will erase it and see if it comes back. There's drag control module. Body control module B. There's a little fault there. Let's see what that is. Reading those codes. Let's see what they are. Left rear turn lamp feedback. Right rear turn lamp feedback. Yeah, a lot of computer stuff in these modern cars, let me tell you. <laughs> we're gonna erase all these codes and see if any of them come back. They're not transmission codes, but as long as we're here, we might as well go through the whole thing. We'll go back to the last one, which is power steering control module. We'll see what that code is. Well, of course, this is electronic power steering control, more computer controls. You'll often get these communication codes, so we'll erase that too. We take it for a road test. We'll see if anything comes back. So now we're gonna start her up and we'll go to some live data and take a road test. But well, we're gonna go to the transmission section take a road test. Rolling through, we can see the injector output faults. There's no faults. The injectors are all working fine. Check it out. The direct injection long-term fuel trim. Zero. Zero. It is running perfectly. You can't run any better than zero. No wonder he's happy with the way it's running. It's running perfectly. Look about that. Look at all the information you get on the generator. Current sensor, corrected value, frequency. Now we all know the voltage is good. It's 14.44, 14.38, but they give all kinds of information. The injectors, no faults. We'll go through them all. Eight of them, seven, eight, and they're all no faults. Now here's a bunch of pressure controlled solenoid information on the transmission that I'm gonna watch while he drives the vehicle. Watch the torque converter, deceleration fuel shut off. That's how these things get good gas mileage. They are all controlled by computers. No faults in the torque converter clutch, giving you the solenoid pressure. See the torque converter slip actual. 
while you're driving now we're coming to a stop as you can see the faster you go the slip definitely goes down <laughs> and it follows the desired versus the actual okay now Ford here we go we're taking off now as you can see now it's got very little car converter slip the actual fluid temperature See, that's normal. You can see the input shaft sensor, the quality. It's good, it's confirmed, it's good, it's confirmed. The frequency, go to the transmission range sensor. Input B, quality factor is good, confirmed. All of it is good. So they did a pretty good job this last time around. <laughs> okay, well, we've done our road test and we'll check the codes. And while it's searching through the codes, well, hey. We know one thing. They did a good job fixing the transmission this the third time because it's not slipping at all. Before, if you was taking off, sometimes it would barely go. It's shifting perfectly fine, not any slippage. Before, when he slowed down, you'd feel the tranny shifting down, clunking down. That's all gone too. So this third time, let's hope it's a charm and they fixed it right. None of the codes came back. It's all green. Well, blue in this case. So they were just minor codes we don't give a crap about. Okay, so what have we learned? Well. Let's hope the third time is a charm for them, because the third time they worked on it with the torque converter change, changed valve bodies, and they've reprogrammed stuff, it is shifting like a dream now. These early 10 speeds, yes, they had problems, but like I said, the later ones don't seem to, and I'm assuming they're putting later software into these things, they figured out what software works best. Now, he's only got about 2,000 miles left on the warranty. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll hope that this third time charm that this is going to last because it is running perfectly now It's actually slipping less than normal I was looking at what the desired slippage is in the actual and the actual is actually less So they've obviously programmed it so it doesn't slip and like I said He's getting 20 something miles a gallon if you drive slow Phenomenal gas mods for a fast car like this driven in regular mode not in sports mode of course What's the moral of the story? Don't buy some when it first comes out <laughs> But they seem to have fixed it. We'll see as time goes on. Believe me, if this thing acts up, he's going to tell me about it, and I'll tell you about it. Well, the third fix went in, and that lasted 5,000 miles or whatever. We'll find out. But it's working perfectly fine now. And if there is a problem and he brings it back, my machine's going to show what's going on. So don't buy the first of anything out there. Only time will tell. But third time a charm for the guy. Let's hope so. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.